Mr. President. Mr. President, I watched with great interest President Obama's speech about our spending and debt crisis. Uh, that's what I would call it. He didn't use as stark terms, unfortunately, but it is a spending and debt crisis. First of all, uh, I'm, I'm at least a little encouraged that he is finally beginning to enter the debate about this crisis. It is headed to a crisis. It is the greatest domestic threat we face as a nation. And at least this speech acknowledges that it is a huge threat and that his own budget submitted just a few months ago was a pass on all of those big issues and he needed a redo. This is a great threat to all of our futures and prosperity. Let me try to put it just a little bit in perspective, Mr. President. Borrowing right now is at least 40 cents out of every dollar. So every dollar the federal government spends, 40 cents of that, over 40 cents, is borrowed money. We're spending $3.7 trillion a year but we're only taking in 2.2 trillion. Because of that, we've recently been racking up over $4 billion of new debt every day. So every day, new debt of $4 billion a day. And a whole lot of that we owe to the Chinese, more than $1 trillion. Now that eventually has very serious consequences in terms of our prosperity, our future, the sort of country and vision and future we can leave for our kids. As interest rates go up, which they inevitably will if we stay on this path, that just downright costs jobs. When interest rates go up 1%, federal debt goes up $140 billion because the debt is so much. When those interest rates eventually go up, it makes it harder for all of us and our families to buy cars and homes, to pay tuition, to create jobs if we're a small business. Admiral Mike Mullen, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, has said that, quote, national debt is our biggest security threat, close quote. So the highest ranking person in uniform in charge of our national security says that our biggest security threat isn't Iran or North Korea or anyone else, it's actually this domestic debt issue. And debt at current levels, which is 94% of GDP, economists say that's already costing us about a million jobs because our debt level is so great. So again, at least the president in his speech today, which is essentially a do-over of his budget from a few months ago, at least the president is beginning to acknowledge that fundamental threat, and that's good. But we need more than a speech, we need more than a vision, we need a real action plan, a detailed plan from the president, and we didn't get that today. So my first reaction to the speech was that it's just that. It was a speech. It was a nice sounding speech. It had a lot of nice themes, but it was a speech. And if the president, who was so quick to criticize Congressman Paul Ryan's budget if he wants to really enter the debate. He needs to enter it on a par with that level of detail, that level of specifics that Congressman Ryan and House Republicans gave. And so the president needs to submit a new budget, a new detailed proposal, not just give a speech. And then we need to engage in a real debate and come up with a plan, an action plan, to tackle this spending and debt issue. And we need to do that before we vote on any debt limit increase. Just speaking for myself, I'm not going to consider increasing the debt limit, which President wants all of us to do, unless and until there's tied to it a real plan to deal with this spending and debt crisis. So this speech today perhaps was a start, but my general reaction is we need more than a speech. We need specifics. We need a new budget submission. And then we need to engage in a bipartisan discussion, a negotiation. 
but we shouldn't wait till May, as the President suggested. That should start immediately tomorrow because we need to hammer out meaningful details before any proposal comes to the floor for votes to increase the debt limit. Now, in terms of the general themes the President struck, I have to say I was uh, disappointed because, to my ears, it was same old, same old. I mean, the first theme was increasing taxes, and he's been at that theme over and over again, and that was absolutely the first theme he hit in his speech, increasing taxes. The problem is, Mr. President, if you look at the level of taxation we have, that is not extraordinarily low. That is not somehow way below normal historical averages. What is way above normal historical averages is spending. And so if you just look at the data compared to history, we have a runaway spending problem. We don't have a taxation problem. Second big theme the President hit was cutting defense spending. Again, coming from a liberal, this is just same old, same old, a traditional predictable theme to cut defense. I don't think that's really a, a new approach or a new discussion from the President. Third big theme was to cut tax expenditures. Now, a lot of folks, at least in Louisiana, won't know what the heck that means. So let me translate. Cutting tax expenditures means increasing taxes. It means doing away with certain deductions and certain credits. It means your tax bill goes up. Now, I'm all for tax code simplification. I think we need an enormously simplified tax code. I do think we need to get rid of a lot of deductions and credits, but that should be used to lower the overall rate particularly rates like the corporate tax rate, which in the U.S. is highest of any industrialized country in the world. And then, in terms of the theme of real cutting, that theme was very short on specifics, very long on general statements, including that entitlements and things like Medicare would not be cut or reformed in any way. So when you look at these broad themes, and that's all there was, broad themes, not specifics. It was, quite frankly, disappointing, sorely disappointing. But at least, perhaps, it's a start. And as I said at the beginning of my remarks, uh, I hope it's a meaningful start, but, but to be a meaningful start and to produce fruit, we need to go from a very broad, very general speech to a detailed submission the President needs to resubmit his entire budget. This is a do-over, so he needs to resubmit a detailed budget which matches Congressman Ryan's proposal in the level of detail and the level of specifics the budget chairman and the House has provided. And then we need to immediately get to a bipartisan discussion and negotiation. Shouldn't wait till May. That should start immediately for one simple reason because I don't think there's any chance of passing any increase to the debt limit without having attached to it major reform, major structural reform that ensures that we are on a new path of lowering spending and lowering debt. Of course, I can only control one vote, but speaking for myself, I will say that I won't even consider those proposals to increase the debt limit unless and until there's a proposal that passes the Congress to actually decrease the debt. Ultimately, the problem isn't the debt limit. The problem is the debt. You know, when an individual has a spending problem or a credit card problem, the solution isn't getting a higher limit on his credit card. The solution is to deal with the spending and the debt problem, which is the underlying core problem. Same here. And so we need to do that as we move in this debt limit discussion. I hope we'll all do that, Mr. President. I hope we'll come together in a meaningful bipartisan way to do that, to actually attack the problem, which is spending, which leads to the second problem, which is debt. 
and to actually propose and pass real reform, real structural reform, before we even have any vote on increasing the debt limit. I urge all of us to work constructively in that regard. I hope the President's speech is a start toward that, but of course time will tell and actions versus words are what ultimately matter. Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor. Mr. President. Senator from Montana. Mr. President, I ask to get unanimous consent that the following staff of the Finance Committee be allowed to Senate floor for the duration of the debate on S-493, Lucy Emerson and Shannon Olberding. Without objection. Mr. President, today more than 47 million Americans rely on Medicare for their health care. For more than 45 years, seniors have had access to the affordable, dependable health care that Medicare provides. We all recognize the cost of health care. We know it's growing, and growing too rapidly. The landmark health reform law that we passed recently took bold steps to rein in costs. And I'm eager to work with my colleagues from both sides of the aisle to further reduce health care costs, increase efficiency, and root out fraud and waste. Last week, the chairman of the House Budget Committee, Congressman Paul Ryan, proposed a plan that would end Medicare as we know it. Rather than providing affordable health care paid for by Medicare, as is the case today, under the Ryan plan, seniors would receive a voucher to produce, excuse me, would receive a voucher to purchase private health insurance. Not to get health care benefits provided for under Medicare, but rather receive a voucher to purchase private health insurance from private health insurance companies. Unfortunately, this voucher would fall far short of covering health care costs for seniors. According to the Independent Congressional Budget Office, under the Ryan plan, quote, most elderly people would pay more, I might add much more, for their health care than they would pay under the current Medicare system. How much more? CBO says that under the Ryan plan, the average 65-year-old would have to pay $12,000 a year to receive the same level of benefits Medicare offers today. $12,000 a year. That is more than double what a senior would have to pay under today's Medicare. So the Ryan plan would double payments seniors have to make and the benefits would be, benefits would be reduced. Under the Ryan plan, there would be no guaranteed benefits that are protected under Medicare today. And as a result, private insurance companies would dictate with care a senior received, ending the current doctor-patient relationship. Our deficit, of course, is serious. It's very serious. It must be addressed. While we need to look for more ways to reduce our deficit, we need to do so in a balanced and fair way. For starters, we shouldn't advance, balance the budget on the backs of seniors. We will not allow Medicare to be dismantled, not on our watch. Yesterday, Senator Bill Nelson and I introduced a sense of the Senate resolution stating that, quote, Medicare should not be dismantled and turned into a voucher or premium support program, end quote. Deficit reduction should not simply shift costs to seniors. And that's exactly what the vouchers in the Ryan budget would do. A voucher system does nothing to lower health care costs. It does not guarantee the benefits Medicare offers today. And it does not provide access to affordable health care. Seniors deserve much better. Mr. President, I listened closely to my colleague from Louisiana a few minutes ago. And frankly, I'm I'm, I'm somewhat heartened. I, I heard from him that um, he wants to move forward, uh, that he would, he said indirectly, vote to increase the debt limit if there's a credible plan to reduce deficits in our national debt. I think that is a proposal that the vast majority of members of this body agree with. Of course, the proof's in the pudding. It's what is that credible plan? What is that mechanism? What is that assurance that we are going to reduce the budget deficits uh, prior to vote to, uh, to increase the debt limit? It's very important that that vote to increase the debt limit occur without brinksmanship. We had far too much brinksmanship in the lead up to the continuing resolution, where it was just a matter of two or three billion dollars in the last 11th hour. The 
vote to increase the debt limit is a far, far more important vote. The stakes are much, much, much higher. The dollar amount is much greater. The financial markets will be watching very closely. And we, members of the Congress, working with the President, must find a way to get the debt limit increased, but with assurance that we're going to get the deficits down and the debt down in a credible way, in a proper period of time, so we don't have to push up to that final moment, the final minute, uh, before the vote on the debt limit occurs. And uh, as I listened to my colleague from Louisiana, I sensed that he wants to find some way. I think we all do. And that is our challenge, Mr. President. That's our charge. Over the next couple of months, find that way. Find that mechanism. Find that process uh, that's credible. It's, it makes sense. It, it, both sides can buy into it, not knowing exactly what the final result will be, but knowing that we're starting down a road to get the budget deficit under control in a balanced, fair way. Um, I do not mean to sound critical. I don't think the Ryan budget proposal uh, is balanced. I don't think it is fair. But I do think members of the Senate, a vast majority, do want to find a fair, balanced solution, and it's up to us to try to find that before that vote on the debt limit occurs. Mr. President, I yield the floor. This is just the opposite of the The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. Thank you. 
Senator from Ohio. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent for the quorum call to be rescinded. Without objection. Thank you, Madam President. This afternoon, after a few days of great anticipation, uh, the President laid out his vision for long-term deficit reduction and dealing with our long-term debt. And now that we've heard from him, I'm afraid we're left with more questions than answers. Uh, let me be clear, I welcome the President to the debate. I think it's a positive sign. There's no more pressing issue for us to address than our dire fiscal situation and our economic challenges. And both of them are intertwined and closely linked. We're not going to be able to improve the economy until we deal with our pending debt crisis. And we can't deal with our fiscal problems without having a growing economy. And there's been a lot of good discussion, particularly over the past month or so, about the unique dangers we face as a country if we don't address our massive deficits and our debt, which is now accumulated to over $14 trillion. That amount, by the way, is equal to the entire size of the United States economy, making uh, this the first time since World War II that we've had a debt at that level. But it's also a lot different than it was in World War II. Then our debt was driven primarily by defense spending, which could be rather quickly curtailed. We also weren't looking at the incredible unfunded obligations that we have today. Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security combined is an unfunded obligation of over $100 trillion. So we're in uncharted territory, unprecedented times, and it's harming our economy today, and of course will devastate our economy in the future if we don't take action. Economists tell us that countries with a debt of 90% of their economy, 90% of GDP, typically lose one point of economic growth. And again, this year, our gross debt is 100% of our GDP. By the way, a 1% reduction in our GDP in America means about 1 million jobs. So already, with a gross debt of 100% of GDP, we've foregone jobs we desperately need in Ohio, my home state, and around the country. This high indebtedness also comes with very significant interest payments, of course. Even with interest rates being so low today, near zero, the magnitude of the U.S. debt still requires a debt service this year of over $200 billion. And by the way, under the President's budget, that number increases to almost $1 trillion 10 years from now, based on the Congressional Budget Office analysis. A trillion dollars a year just in interest payments on the debt. What concerns me is that interest rates could well go up given this climate. One percent increase in interest revolves, uh, in, involves another $130 billion of interest payments. Think about that. Just a one percent increase in interest rates means another $130 billion in interest payments. Obviously, in, inflation would be causing additional damage to an already precarious budget situation, and that's another great risk that we face. Our current deficits are also increasingly financed by foreign holders of U.S. debt. At present, nearly half of the U.S. publicly held debt is held by foreign investors, and as those U.S. deficits are increasingly foreign financed, of course, our interest payments are leaving the country. Uh, it is estimated that in 2010, interest payments to foreign entities and foreign individuals amounted to over 140 billion dollars. That's based on the new data from the Department of Commerce. So it's not just about these high debt payments, it's the fact that a lot of it's going overseas. And persistent deficits and this pending debt crisis, of course, also introduces a lot of uncertainty into our economy. Some immediate evidence of this effect appears on the balance sheets of America's businesses, which show $1.9 trillion in what's called liquid holdings. What does this mean? This means that money is sitting on the sidelines rather than being invested in jobs and plant and equipment. Resolving the uncertainty surrounding future deficits will induce greater investment as companies can be able to plan more effectively. We've already seen these concerns manifest themselves in various ways. Capital markets are responding. Investors such as PIMCO, which was the largest holder of U.S. Treasuries, is now out altogether telling us they no longer trust U.S. debt. What will happen if we don't address these challenges is even more daunting. According to the Congressional Budget Office, assuming the continuation of current policy, debt held by the public as a share of our economy is projected to reach an implausibly high 947% by 2030. 
by the year 2084. Of course, that won't happen. The U.S. would face a debt crisis long before that. But it merely illustrates the unsustainability of the current fiscal situation. No economic model can tell us what the economy would look like into the future, because by then, those models essentially fall apart. Over time, the accumulation of debt increases the cost of debt service, consuming, of course, a greater share of revenues, limiting budget resources for other priorities and for meeting unseen emergencies, such as a natural disaster or war. As time progresses, the fiscal crisis resulting from high indebtedness could occur very rapidly as investors lose confidence in U.S. Treasuries. Absent policy changes that are meaningful and immediate, the U.S. is going to have to pay higher yields on its own debt to roll over existing debt and avoid default. We're going to have to pay higher interest rates to attract investors to our country. In addition to the cost of increased and largely wasted interest expense to the government, higher interest rates, of course, would be devastating for American families. Think about it. As interest rates go up, because Treasury rates go up, this means home mortgages go up. This means college loan payments go up. This means interest rates on car loans go up, credit card activity, and other loans. Uh, the economy is tough enough. We don't need these higher interest rates, and yet that's what's upon us unless we act and act now. The magnitude of the debt crisis would escalate as these higher interest costs would require additional borrowing, of course, at higher rates, which would ultimately grind the economy to a halt as investors lost confidence in the U.S. ability to repay. The global impact of the U.S. debt crisis would be far-reaching and truly unprecedented. We just went through a tough recession. We don't need to re relive that. All things being equal, debt financing of current consumption necessarily imposes future obligations on subsequent generations either in the form of higher taxes or reduced consumption of government services. To avoid a debt crisis, any policy changes must begin sooner rather than later to minimize those effects that unfortunately are likely to happen even if we act. Given the threats and crisis just described, there's no doubt that America is in need of real leadership to address this fiscal threat. While we can debate some of the specifics in Congressman Ryan's budget, there's no doubt that the House Republican plan demonstrates necessary leadership on the severe fiscal challenges our country faces. This is in contrast to the plan that President Obama sent to the Congress just two months ago. It not only rejects the serious recommendations from his own fiscal commission, but unfortunately, as Erskine Bowles, the Democratic co-chair of the President's commission said, and I quote, it goes nowhere near where they will have to go to resolve our fiscal nightmare. And unfortunately, the President's speech today provides no specifics as how to resolve that fiscal nightmare. More spending, more borrowing, more taxes is not a prescription for spending constraint and economic growth. Since President Obama took office, we've seen trillions in new spending and record deficits. The February budget I talked about just locks that new spending in place, doing nothing to pull back from this dangerous spiral of debt. Let's be clear, this is not just a budget issue. It is an economic issue, and it's definitely a jobs issue. Not only will debt and deficit have a long-term impact on our children and grandchildren who have to foot the bill for today's spending, but we're beginning to see this immediate impact on economic stability and job growth as the cost of our debt begins to crowd out private sector investment. We've got to move quickly to substantially reduce the debt and deficit, strengthen our fiscal house, and in doing so, foster job creation in states like mine, Ohio, and around the country. The Commission's plan that the President uh, rejected in December cuts deficits by about $4.1 trillion compared to the baseline of current policy over a 10-year period. It brings our deficits to 1.2 percent of our economy by 2020. Compare that to today, we're at almost 10 percent of our economy. So it sets a standard. Over $4 trillion in reductions in the deficit and an annual deficit that is 1.2 percent which incidentally is where our budget deficit was about four years ago. Congressman Ryan's budget got there by bringing deficits down by about $4.2 trillion by 2021 as compared to a comparable baseline to the Commission's report, so $4.1, $4.2 trillion. And the deficit is about 1.5 percent of GDP. The President's own budget, again, two months ago submitted here to Congress, is very different. His budget barely gets a quarter of the way there, $1.1 trillion, 
and that assumes that all the administration's claimed savings occur, and it assumes, frankly, that there is a higher rate of economic growth than the Congressional Budget Office thinks there will be, which actually wipes out the deficit savings that the President claims. So we have very different visions, don't we? We have the Fiscal Commission on the one hand and the Ryan budget in the $4 trillion range, and then a plan by the President uh, that does not get us uh, moving forward in terms of deficit reduction, and in fact doubles the debt in the next 10 years. Evidently, after seeing Republicans move forward last week and now this week in the House, and after seeing how on a bipartisan basis uh, and around the country people reacted to his budget, President Obama has realized that he needs to move forward with a new proposal. In a sense, he's asking for a mulligan, uh, and I think that's good. I think it's good that he has acknowledged that this problem is deeper and more serious than his budget proposal indicated, and that we need to move forward together. Unfortunately, again, the President did not offer specifics today. Unlike the Ryan budget, that takes some bold and courageous steps, tough steps, but does offer specifics. The President chose instead to squander this opportunity to offer a real way forward on tackling our structural fiscal problems. He did talk about $4 trillion in deficit reduction, and I appreciate that, uh, but again, did not offer a way to get there. The National Commission that he formed and that reported in December told the President that there was a way to get there, and I hope that the President will relook at his own commission and other proposals like the Ryan proposal. As the President made clear, we've been debating just 12 percent of the budget. He's right about that. Uh, there's some defense spending that's involved, but for the most part, it's a very small part of the budget. So what does this proposal do to address these additional challenges? Uh, I didn't hear anything today. There were serious proposals to address the entitlement programs, which are incredibly important programs, but on an unsustainable footing. On Medicare, the President proposed delegating future unspecified savings to a government board unelected and unaccountable. On Medicaid, the President seems to be delegating responsibility to the National Governors Association. On Social Security, the President told us today it doesn't contribute to our deficit, despite the fact that the program is in cash deficit this year by $45 billion, $45 billion of payroll taxes less than the payments going out. The President proposed $4 trillion in deficit reduction and yet has shrunk at this point from the responsibility of telling us how he would achieve it, except that he'd leave the challenge largely to others while pursuing tax increases that I fear will harm the little recovery that we see coming out of this deep recession. So I look forward to working with members on both sides of the aisle and the President to address the serious challenges we've talked about today. Now, I wish we'd seen more specifics today, but I am encouraged the President is at least engaging in the game welcoming his involvement because it's too important for us not to have involvement from both sides of the aisle. And without White House leadership, we cannot move forward. So, Mr. President, as you say so often, let's get focused, not on the next election, but on the next generation. Thank you, Madam President. President. The Senator from Iowa. Madam President, I ask unanimous consent that Megan Cheney, Nicole Maya, Ogawa, and Jan Spitzenbart of my staff be granted floor privileges for the duration of today's session. Yeah. Madam President, the Senate will have before it today or tomorrow, depending upon the flow around here, two very misguided bills. Uh, this will come about on our uh, when we have our budget come up for a vote here under an agreement to get that budget up, uh, we're going to have a vote on two separate bills. One bill would uh, totally repeal and defund the, uh, the Affordable Care Act, the health reform bill that we passed. The other one would, de would prevent funding for Planned Parenthood. So I want to take a few minutes here on the floor of the Senate to speak about how misguided uh, these two bills are. First, let me talk about the bill that would defund the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the this bill that we would be voting on will prohibit any funds appropriated this year 
and any funds appropriated in any prior year from being used to carry out the Affordable Care Act. This would remove the engine from health care reform when the train is steaming down the track. So again, why are we voting on this? The reason is that Republicans have tried a frontal assault on the Affordable Care Act, a debate on the merits, and they failed. This body voted down Senator McConnell's amendment to the FAA authorization bill that would have repealed health reform in its entirety. But I guess what you can't do directly, you try to do indirectly. So now, Republicans are trying to undermine health reform by other means, such as defunding it. Well, this strategy only makes sense if you're absolutely obsessed, obsessed with tearing down health reform. Make no mistake about it, this bill is the equivalent of repeal. By depriving the bill of all funding, it would turn back the clock on all that we have accomplished over the past year. It would take us back to the bad old days when insurance companies were in the driver's seat, telling you what kind of health care you're entitled to and when you're entitled to it. Instead of protecting all Americans against arbitrary limits on coverage, repeal would take us back to the days when insurance companies could turn off your coverage just when you are the sickest. That would hurt families like the Grasshoffs from Texas, who testified before my committee earlier this year. They were unable to find coverage that would pay for their son's hemophilia treatment until the Affordable Care Act banned lifetime limits. Instead of allowing young people starting a new job or a new business or going off to school to stay under parents' insurance until age 26, Repeal would make them fend for themselves in a chaotic market that offers too little coverage for too much money. That would hurt, folk, hurt folks like Emily Schlichting, who suffers from a rare autoimmune disorder that would make her uninsurable in the bad old days. But because of the Affordable Care Act, she's able to stay on her parents' policy until she's 26. Again, at a HELP Committee hearing in January, this is Emily wonderful young woman. She said, young people are the future of this country and we are the most affected by the reform. We're the generation that is most uninsured. We need the Affordable Care Act because it is literally an investment in the future of this country. It would hurt folks like Carol in Ankeny, Iowa, whose 19-year-old daughter was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes nine years ago. Thanks to the Affordable Care Act, Carol doesn't have to worry about her daughter's pre-existing condition disqualifying her for insurance coverage. And she can stay on her parents' health insurance coverage after college. Carol also doesn't have to worry about the cost of her daughter's care running up against a lifetime cap that would be imposed by an insurance company. Health reform banned those limits. Carol wrote me a very nice letter to say, thank you for doing the right thing. Madam President, instead of protecting nearly half of non-elderly Americans who have pre-existing conditions like high blood pressure or diabetes or heart disease from denial of coverage, repeal would put insurance companies back in the driver's seat picking and choosing whom to cover. Instead of helping small businesses struggling in this recession with the cost of insurance premiums, repeal the Affordable Care Act would take away $40 billion in tax credits that reduce premiums for small businesses. Instead of helping all Americans prevent illness or disease by providing free preventative services like mammograms and colonoscopies, repeal would allow insurers to charge expensive co-pays for these important services, thus discouraging people from getting colonoscopies or mammogram screenings. If we pass this bill, this bill to defund the Affordable Care Act, Congress will turn its back on America's seniors, tossing out hard-won improvements in Medicare benefits and damaging the program's fiscal health. It would reopen the Medicare Part D donut hole, exposing millions of seniors to the full cost of drugs when they need the most assistance. Repealing the Affordable Care Act would increase seniors' drug prices on average by more than $800 this year and $3,500 over the next 10 years. 
It would roll back the unprecedented investment the Affordable Care Act makes in Medicare fraud prevention. Turning back the Affordable Care Act would hurt seniors' access to health care in rural areas by eliminating incentive payments that are in the Affordable Care Act paid to rural primary care providers. Repealing or defunding, as this bill would do, defunding the Affordable Care Act would roll back improvements to Medicare payment policy, coordination and efficiency that extend the life of Medicare trust fund by over a decade. In addition, Madam President, Secretary Sebelius has informed us that payments to Medicare providers would be significantly disrupted by this bill, which again will defund the Affordable Care Act. Finally, we come to the part of this debate that even Alice in Wonderland would have a tough time understanding. The House Republicans have played the Washington stage for all it's worth over the last few weeks, making great solemn speeches to the balconies and to the audiences about the deficit and the debt. But as a condition for agreeing to fund the government for the remainder of this year, what are they demanding? They want to defund and thus repeal the Affordable Care Act, one of the best and biggest deficit-reducing measures in decades. The Affordable Care Act reduces the deficit by $210 billion in the next 10, in the next 10 years, more than a trillion in the next 10 years. And again, here's a chart that shows that. In the next 10 years, according to the Congressional Budget Office, the Affordable Care Act will reduce the deficit by $210 billion. Therefore, if you repeal it, you would increase the deficit by $210 billion. But here's where the real savings come. In the next decade, the Congressional Budget Office says that the Affordable Care Act will reduce the deficit by $1 trillion. So if you defund it, as this bill would do, you will increase the deficit by $1 trillion. That's what the Republicans want. They want to absolutely increase the deficit. They must, because they want to do away with the Affordable Care Act. So let me get this straight. The Republicans are proposing to reduce the deficit by increasing the deficits. As I said, somehow I have a feeling when I hear that we're not in Kansas any longer. This is Alice in Wonderland kind of thinking. So, Madam President, we had to stop the silly games. This debate, this debate isn't about deficit reduction. It's about tearing down health reform, no matter what. No matter if it does increase the deficit, get rid of it. Get rid of health care reform. It's about giving control back to wealthy, powerful health insurance companies who can raise your rates, deny you benefits, and make increasingly more profits. Nothing makes the nature of the agenda of my friends on the Republican side more clear than the 2012 proposed budget released by the Republican House Budget Committee Chairman last week. The Republican budget plan is very simply a massive transfer of wealth, a massive transfer of wealth from low and middle income Americans to the wealthiest in our country. Two-thirds, two-thirds of the budget savings in the Republican budget proposal come from drastically cutting programs that serve those with modest means, while permanently extending President Bush's tax cuts for the rich. And how is this massive wealth shift paid for? Well, they would repeal the majority of the Affordable Care Act, taking coverage away from more than 32 million Americans who would be covered under current law. Starting in 2022, the Republican budget proposal eliminates Medicare as we know it, turning over the program to private health insurance companies. Instead of enrolling seniors in Medicare, the Republicans' plan would give them a voucher to go out and buy private insurance coverage on the open market. 
And since the voucher would not keep up with rising medical costs, seniors would fall further and further behind. The Congressional Budget Office has said that this would more than double, more than double out-of-pocket costs for seniors entering the program in 2022 would triple the cost by 2030. And where would that money go? Well, to the private health insurance industry. Well, that sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? The Republicans' obsession, obsession with repealing the new health reform law is not based on budgetary considerations. It's based strictly on ideology. In 1965, President Johnson and this Congress passed Medicare, ensuring seniors access to decent health care. Republicans fought it bitterly then. Forty-five years later, they're still trying to undo it. And here they go again. So the choice before us is to go forward or to be dragged backward. Let us come together as a united American people to create a reformed health care system that works not just for the healthy and the wealthy, but for all Americans. Now, Madam President, there's a second bill that we will be voting on in conjunction with the budget. The Republicans insisted on this in order to have a vote on the budget. It is as equally misguided and as dangerous, I think, as the other bill. This second bill would prohibit, prohibit a law-abiding and extraordinarily successful organization from participating in fair competitions for federal funding. This entity would, of course, be Planned Parenthood. Now, again, let's be clear what this bill is not about. It's not about the need to prevent federal funds from being used to pay for abortions. Long-standing rules under the Title X program already strictly prohibit the use of taxpayer dollars to fund abortions. What's more, every appropriations bill for the last two decades has stated that no funds can be used for any abortion. So, Madam President, this bill is not about abortion. It is about banning, banning a specific organization from even competing for federal funds simply because some people don't agree with that organization. This would create a very disturbing and dangerous precedent. When Congress creates a program, it typically specifies rules or criteria for participation in that program. Anyone who, or any organization, who agrees to play by these rules and criteria is eligible to compete. Planned Parenthood is playing by the rules. That's one reason. It is one of the most widely respected health care providers in the United States. Of 5.2 million women served every year, every year, by the Title X program, one out of three, 31 percent, received care at Planned Parenthood health centers. Now, if someone can show me a specific clinic that isn't following the rules, by all means, take away their funding. But that's not what this bill does. This bill says that Planned Parenthood, as an entity, would be banned from even competing to provide services under Title X, despite the fact that they conform to all of the rules of the program. And it doesn't only just ban Planned Parenthood from offering family planning services. That's one aspect of what Planned Parenthood does, but this bill would turn away nearly one million women a year who receive cervical cancer screenings through Planned Parenthood clinical services, as well as 830,000 women every year who get breast exams at Planned Parenthood clinical services. It would turn away Countless hundreds of thousands of women and men who receive physical exams and immunizations at Planned Parenthood Clinical Services. 
Madam President, my office has been deluged by emails and phone calls from Iowans and other Americans who oppose this misguided effort to ban Planned Parenthood from receiving funding under Title X. I stand with them in support of the important services these clinics provide to women and men throughout the country. A constituent of mine writes, Dear Senator Harkin, I want to let you know that cutting funds to Planned Parenthood will jeopardize the lives of many women and some of the men who go there for basic reproductive health screenings. I say this with confidence, as Planned Parenthood was the only clinic I could afford 10 years ago to obtain yearly pap smears. It was Planned Parenthood that found my cervical cancer and referred me to a specialist for treatment. Due to the existence and actions of Planned Parenthood, I am alive today as a healthy and contributing member of society. I work with undergraduate and graduate students, and several of them have mentioned that Planned Parenthood was their only option for affordable screenings. Please ensure that government funding will be allocated to Planned Parenthood. Please do not have young or socioeconomically strapped women potentially lose their life over a cancer that is remedied when caught in its early stages. That was the end of her letter. Madam President, we need to listen to voices like this. We need to listen to the women of America who rely on Planned Parenthood. Finally, Madam President, I believe this bill goes to the heart of whether we can reach common ground on something we should all agree on the need to find ways to reduce the need for abortions in America. Now, let me say at the outset, I strongly believe that we must preserve the right of every woman to her own reproductive choices that exist under the Supreme Court's decision in Roe v. Wade. But to reduce the number of abortions, we must prevent unwanted pregnancies just as we must also support women who want to carry their pregnancies to term. That is precisely what Title X funding accomplishes. Family planning services at Title X health centers, including, including Planned Parenthood, prevent an estimated 973,000 unintended pregnancies a year. And this in turn obviates what a woman might turn to in desperation for hundreds of thousands of abortions every year. Unfortunately, during the debate on Planned Parenthood in recent days, we have heard many wild and inaccurate claims about the work of this dedicated organization. On that score, I have always agreed with our former colleague, the late Senator Pat Moynihan, who said that, quote, people are entitled to their own opinions, but they're not entitled to their own facts. Well, last week, our distinguished colleague, the junior senator from Arizona, stood here on the floor of the Senate and stated that abortion, quote, is well over 90% of what Planned Parenthood does, end quote. Stated right here on the Senate floor by the junior senator from Arizona. Of course, that is grossly inaccurate. Planned Parenthood spends the overwhelming majority of its resources keeping women healthy and preventing the need for abortion in the first place. The fact, the fact, the fact is that just 3% of Planned Parenthood services are related to abortion. When news organizations asked the office of the senator from Arizona for evidence of his claim, a spokesperson bizarrely stated, and I quote, his remark was not intended to be a factual statement. End quote. Well, what was it intended to be? Madam President, the floor of the Senate is not a place for destructive and false assertions, especially when used to argue that an organization should be redlined and singled out for discrimination. For the record, Planned Parenthood is one of the most respected women's health organizations in the United States. It courageously defends the right of women in America to make informed, independent decisions about their health and family planning. And provide, by providing women with counsel, and contraception, Planned Parenthood prevents countless unwanted pregnancies and thereby reduces the number of abortions in this country. And Madam President, lest there be any misunderstanding, 
I intend this as a factual statement. Now let me conclude by making clear that the one certain impact of this bill, if it was passed, will be to increase the number of abortions in America. This bill would dramatically erode the effectiveness of Title X in preventing unintended pregnancies, preventing sexually transmitted infections, detecting cancers early, keeping people healthy through quality preventative care. It would have this impact because this misguided bill would ban, would ban an extraordinarily successful organization, Planned Parenthood, from providing these services. So on this bill, we have to say no to unintended pregnancies and, un and unnecessary abortions. Say no to this misguided and counterproductive bill. So Madam President, we have this vote on the budget, but then we have these two sideline votes. One that would defund the Affordable Care Act and send us back to the bad old days of health insurance companies deciding who gets what when at insanely big profits to them. Secondly, it would ban Planned Parenthood from even applying, even applying to be a provider of health resources and services to 5.2 million women every year in this country. So, Madam President, I hope that the Congress, the Senate, will rise above these misguided bills, will rise above unfactual assertions made upon the floor of the Senate, no matter how they were intended, and we'll make sure that Planned Parenthood can continue, can continue to provide the vital services it does in this country. Madam President, I yield the floor and I note the absence of a quorum.